and welcome to Talk Together. Thank you for joining us for an evening of talking about Dungeons and Dragons and other TTRPGs usually, but actually tonight we're going to be specifically talking about just Dungeons and Dragons and we'll get onto that more in a moment. I am your host Natalie and I will be talking to Chris. You can see Chris here. So, Hello Chris. Hey, hey. Uh, now usually Chris. Eat. I would be asking you questions about Dungeons and Dragons and TTRPGs and your experiences. And we would be rolling a d20. Yeah. Find out which question mm -hmm. you would be asking. Mm -hmm. However, someone gave me control and leeway to change the format up a little bit. <laughs> so. Yeah, I'm regretting that decision. Go on. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so tonight we're going to be doing something a little bit different. Mm -hmm. I have been given power. And uh, you'll find out what that is in just a moment. I'm going to let. Chris sit there quaking in their boots you've, you've while I talk me about some the... dirty hints, but I'm not 100% sure yet. So, <laughs> okay. Well, you can ponder for a little bit longer while I go through the sponsors. And Great. I'm going to nervously fiddle. That's what I'm going to do. Sure, do. <laughs> my Lego figurine of me that my son gave. I'm going to fiddle with them. Oh, uh, show us. It's not. I want to see. Okay. It's not perfect. It's very, uh -huh. very cute and close. It's got a mohawk. Cute. Like, mine, like the mohawk, yeah. And it's got a sort of builders y kind of shirt. But this is what I used to sort of dress like. And yeah. It's quite old now, but it is it is cute. And it's holding an is apple. An for apple? I don't know why it's holding an apple. That's Ivo gave it to me fine. and said, this makes made me think of you and I didn't want to disappoint. So that is I think it's close. It's good. Is it a hint that you need to eat more fruit? It's probably maybe. Yes. Let's say yes. Good. We've gone off the rails already. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna talk about the sponsors and supporters. Okay. Um so this stream will run for about an hour. Uh, we're delighted to be sponsored by Hero Forge, Ultra Pro, and Elderwood Academy. And you can see all the, the logos around us. And we're also supported by DD Beyond, Warriors of Waterdeep, and Level Up Dice. Thank you very much to all of those. You can find us under Roll Together RPG across a multitude of social media platforms, including Patreon. Hello, D20 Club, you're all amazing and awesome. Um, you you can also be as cool as they are if you go to Patreon and search for Roll Together RPG and they, they do cool things like um like like the wiki and like they they're, they're on the Discord and uh, and all sorts. So uh, be as cool as they are. Um our shows are also available as podcasts. Hello to our podcast listeners. Just search for Roll Together hello. RPG. Hello podcast listeners. Hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> uh, just search for Roll Together RPG on your favorite podcasting app. And uh yeah so that's the important stuff. So Chris, before we, we dive into what we're doing mm -hmm. today, just just give us, <laughs> for, for people who've never watched Roll Together before, sure. have no idea who this person is. Who are you? Why are you here? I'm Chris, I use they, them pronouns. Uh, I'm the head of production at Roll Together. So um, I handle a lot of the sort of stuff that comes in. Like um, we pre-record, I do a lot of the editing. I organize a team of editors and mods and all the rest of it to put all the shows together. Um, I talk to all the sponsors and organize all of the animated miniatures and that sort of thing. And I'm also one of the DMs on the channel and I've DMed quite a few shows. Currently, currently, I'm not DMing anything this season, which is nice. So it's all I'm doing a one shot. That's just been confirmed. I'm doing a one shot. So, um, well, more about that when we release it. it hasn't been released yet. But um, well, yes, yeah. Well, actually, it's it's good that you mentioned actually that you do a lot of DMing um, hmm. because we're going to do a bit of that tonight. Um, I, as, as people know, I am a player of, of the D and D, and I have dabbled in DMing. I have done the odd one shot here and there for mm. the off, absolutely off stream, um, but for for family. Mm. And I've also run uh, other short campaigns with other systems. Mm -hmm. But oh, I want to get a hang of this D and D DMing thing, Chris. I want to get a hang of it. And and I've decided you're going to help me. And you're going to help me. Is this preamble for you stream. DMing on stream? Because I want this. I don't. I don't know yet. Oh. We'll see how this goes. <laughs> okay, this is my task. <laughs> Make it, I don't know. <laughs> honestly, I know this is useful because before we even started, and this is great, um, this is such a cool idea. I'm, sorry, I'm really excited. Um, it's not as difficult as people think it is. I really want to stress that. It's something I stress constantly. People look at DMing and go, oh, you have to not, you know, but you have to think of all the, mm, there's a couple of like shortcuts of mental processing, but beyond that, as long as you are having fun and your players are having fun and feel like they can do things, you're doing a good job. That's all it is. And everything beyond that is window dressing. See, these are the thing, these are excellent points that you've raised because these are the elements in particular that I 
I, I, I am quite controlling. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I like a spreadsheet. I like mm-hmm. a plan. Mm-hmm. Chris, you also know this. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's that's, um, that's no bad thing. I don't know why yeah. you're holding this up like a negative. The fact that you do. I mean, I famously do not. I am disorganized is a strong word, but I tend to sort of. There's a thing that needs doing. Do it, and then it's done. <laughs> and that way, I don't have to worry about it ever again, which is great for someone with anxiety. But yeah. yeah. So the the biggest things that I was concerned about when when starting to to look at home brewing uh, mm-hmm. a one shot mm-hmm. was the um, what if I haven't thought of everything because okay. I know what players can be like mm-hmm. um, and the to a lesser extent what if I forget a rule but usually sure. unless you're playing with brand new beginners uh, in which case. I don't know. Um, there's <laughs> going to be someone else there who does, who can correct you. And as long as you don't have an ego about that and everyone's mm. going in with a collaborative, like, we're here to have fun and try this and play, yeah. then that's fine. Well, let's, let's start with the rules question because that's an easy one. I mean, it's not because D&D is famously complex. And it is. There's no denying it is a complex game with many, many complex like rule bits. What's important is that quite a lot of them are optional or at least if not optional, certainly are a fine detail, nitty gritty version of the rules that you don't need to run. Like people who've seen me DM on on stream and in home games will know, I tend to lead into what's called the rule of cool quite heavily, which is if a player says I want to do something cool, I like to I like to let them. I think it's more interesting to empower players' choices over going, no, the rules say you can't do that. Because yeah. that, it feels reductive. If it's something that's over the top or is going to absolutely stop everyone else from having creative ideas or is going to derail everything that's going on, I might pull back a little. I tend to fall back a little bit on, is it feasible? Mm-hmm. Like, um, you've seen in Warriors of Waterdeep is one that you've been in that I've DM'd. Um, I will often look at things like, I know it's magic, but let's just envisage the physics for a second and see if it's plausible. Mm-hmm. Because from that point on, you can go, it's plausible enough, we can hand wave, or you can go, I don't think that's quite how that would work, but here's an advantage that you have gained that doesn't completely close off everything that we are doing at this point in time. So from that perspective, rules are there as a guidance tool, not Mm -hmm. as a stricture in in the way I DM. And I'd recommend for most DMs. There are some players who really like that. Strictures, these must be these ways, and all power to them is not for me. Um, The rules themselves. You have the internet. We all have the internet, a wonderful resource, which means that anything you're unsure of, you can check. People who watch me DM and you have seen me do this will go, I'll check what Jeremy Crawford says because yeah. Sage Advice is a, it used to be a column. It's now a website. It's now catalogued. It's all tweets and that sort of thing. But you can search through that and find people's advice, generally speaking, on how to handle a rule situation you're unsure of. And there will always be rule situations you're unsure of. Mods throw a link to Sage Advice. In the <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that being said, we, we also we're, we're supported by DD Beyond, who are fantastic, mm-hmm. and they are oh, yeah. their their search bar is is great. You can search anything that you're unsure of about how. Like I often forget what conditions specifically mean because they're quite arcane, mm-hmm. and knowing that you can search those before DD Beyond, I had like a binder with mm-hmm. all of the DD spells in it that I would leaf through to find the spell to make sure that I understood what the player wanted to do because I can't memorize all of them, there's too many of them. And new ones get added all the time. So there's no harm, no foul in interacting with the players with the rules. They they should, and I don't mean that like they should, I mean more like they should know how their character works. Like, th- there are things they'll be unsure of and that's fine. But then probably not going to walk into a stream saying, I'm playing this and I've not looked up how it works at yeah. all. Because... Yeah. I mean, I don't know about you, but I feel very comfortable walking into rooms saying, I'm playing this, you know how it works? Nah, it'd be fine. I, yep, I feel like that's that. that's a bit... But I know players who play like that, and that's okay, but all I want players to come in with is a basic, like, I think I know how this works. And from that yeah. point on, you two can collaboratively work out, and the other players can collaboratively work out as well. Yeah, see, I think um, you mentioned spells, and when it comes yeah. to rules, I think I've... Personally, I think I've got a, a good enough grasp of most of the other rules, but especially being someone who tends to play martial classes, I don't have an an intricate knowledge of Mm -hmm. all of the spells. So when it comes to designing a challenge for players to overcome, one of my worries is, oh, is there a spell that I don't know that they can just just negate that challenge completely? Yes, probably, and that's a good thing. You want them to negate the challenge. I mean, we'll get on to the second point you were making. What if they come in and break everything? Because that's that's really useful. They're going to, they're players. Mm -hmm. And... 
you want them to. Mm-hmm. Like that's <laughs> there's the how it depends on the DM and their style. But do you want to set up challenges that will be challenging? Do you want to um, punish your players for being so have the temerity to to enter your world and not do it correctly? Again, more power to the DMs who want to play that way and players who enjoy being played with in that way. From my perspective, every single encounter or scenario or campaign even is a series of um, dominoes that the players are slowly knocking over. Mm -hmm. They will probably knock them all over. If they're lucky, they'll knock one over and then all of them fall over. Sometimes they'll knock over a wider range, sometimes a smaller range, but in the end, I want them to knock them all over. Yeah. Because if I make a villain that's unkillable, well, what was the point of that? Mm -hmm. Because I want the players to succeed and I want the players to do something, to succeed in interesting ways, to give them challenges they can't just, you know, punch people until it's dead. Traps are a really good example of this as well. Like, do you want players to be able to just walk over the trap or do you want them to spend a good half hour footling around with the trap to see how they can deal with something as basic as a hole in the floor? Like, these are... You are trying to create scenarios where they do stuff. You're trying to create situations where they use their spells, their in-game abilities, skill checks. Um, There's a number of different ways you can handle those situations. But what you're looking for is for things for them to overcome. You're never looking for them to make something that they can't overcome. And frankly, if they spend five minutes on something you thought they might take half an hour on, that's not a bad thing. No. Because in the end, D&D... I say this before, and I don't mean to be reductive. I really, really don't. But D&D, a lot of the rules and a lot of the design of the game and a lot of the building blocks of it are based around combat. Mm -hmm. A lot of the character classes are based around what they do in combat. Therefore, combat takes up the most time. So, in a one-shot, great example, you're probably not going to get more than two combats. Yeah. Depending on what level you're setting at, it could be fewer or more, but you don't want to have so much stuff around the combats that the combat's the thing that drags on and makes it run too long and everyone gets bored and wants to go home. You want the combat to be snappy and quick, and you want it to happen as part of the narrative and you want it to feel satisfying when it's done. It needs to be built into the stuff, built into the structure of, of the one shot, which means that any other challenge you are hoping they will get through quickly, or you are taking combatants out of the final fight. Because that's the only yeah. way you can <laughs> pull things back, or you're just knocking hit points off the boss, because that's the only way you can pull back in terms of time to make everyone stay together, cohesive and happy for that length of time that you're running, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Yeah. Okay, so, Let's, I think, let's get a specific example mm-hmm, 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 and mm-hmm. work our way through the process. Sure, sure. All right. So. What are you doing? Uh, <laughs> You're looking at a screen. What's happened? Yep. I have I have four different potential scenarios. Um, who, who, I'm going to caveat this who? with two of these are from me and two of these are from Tom. Okay. Okay, <laughs> fine. <Sorry. laughs> I'm going to roll a d4. And I, I will say this now. If if uh, if this works, if people enjoy this process, um, the I'm not going to talk through what the other options are because oh. who knows, we might do this again. Sure, um, sure, sure. Okay. And we'll see. We'll oh. see. So let, let's see what we come up with. Rolling the d4. All right. Roll That's that a three. <laughs> okay. Well, this is, this is, this is going to be interesting. Uh, Go on. So... Based off what we were just saying about combat being can can be the biggest chunk, especially in a one shot, and it takes mm-hmm. a lot of time. Mm-hmm. That being said, we love role play. Of course. So we don't want to diminish that. So this all. one, the challenge of this, this is potentially one that actually for a new BTM might be really difficult. You never know, but it's always possible. But we'll oh. see. Uh, okay, so this is a big bad B bag smackdown. Okay, just the whole one shot is a big bad b Smackdown. This is a high-level slug match with a legendary monster, but we need to find the way to make the story important rather than it just being a dice-rolling exercise. Cool, so, okay. with this, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to mulligan Orcus because, for two reasons. <laughs> because I've already done a one-shot Smackdown with Orcus on Sabotage the DM stream. Okay. Um, spoilers, I, I played an Asimar Paladin. Uh, oh, yeah. Paladin, Annihilated and him. Of I absolutely destroyed him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. She was, she was in, inspired by the Queen of Hearts as well. So it was <laughs> lots of ego. It was fantastic. <laughs> cool. um, but also, I feel like Orcus, there's some snippets and trails oh, yeah. of Orcus in Roll Together streams already. And I don't want to touch that. Um, 
I might also mulligan the Tarask because I feel like that is too obvious. Uh, but <laughs> are there any other well, super high level? <laughs> you're already like bam, 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 bam. I've already got five, yeah. Great, good. Okay. Like, it depends on what you want. You want it to be something that isn't just about defeating something, which mm-hmm. for me takes anything that is uniformly um, unnegotiable with or wouldn't have many goals apart from just kill the party mm-hmm. off the table. So most creatures you can find some kind of um, raison d'etre that isn't just murder, but um, what you want to find is something where there is um, more going on. The classic would be a dragon, mm-hmm. because dragons... If heroes have invaded their lair, then there's going to be a long, drawn-out combat because most dragons aren't going to just literally walk up to the front door, fire breath you, and walk away again. They tend to have more going on than that. You also then have the fun, for example, of heroes going into a dragon's lair when it's not present, and then the dragon arrives and you have a cat-and-mouse game as they try to escape. Yeah. So that already... That's a classic D&D setup of a dragon's lair. Already a classic setup for a one-shot anyway, and the dragon then being used as not just a villain or a beebeg or something to fight, but also as something to hide from, run away from, avoid their traps and things that they can do, because dragons have ridiculously high perception. Their passive mm-hmm. perceptions are like 22 and stuff like that, so being able to find ways to hide from them is going to be very, very tricky. So that could be a fun way of running a one-shot. Okay, if we're going to go, well, mm-hmm. if you have other thoughts, then we can just explore those. But I was going to say, if we're going to do a <laughs> dragon, I would like it to be, because since I read about it in Fizzbands, I was like, oh God, this is horrible. Which one? The Elder Brain Dragon. Oh, yes. Can we just hold that thought over there for a second so I can give you yes. the other options, because I've yes. now got more thoughts on that, but that's not helpful. Um, okay. In terms of other super high-level monsters, we've already had one on a Roll Together stream that is one I particularly like, which is a, um, an inevitable, Quirut. Mm. Um, we had to homebrew that because they don't exist currently in D&D um, 5e, which is a shame because inevitables are super cool. But that's a great example of something that has a single moral imperative or a single thing it is trying to accomplish. And it is um, lawful to the point of stupid. Mm-hmm. because it is a, it is a robot, it's designed to have a very specific purpose. So that could be one about, it has a very specific thing it needs to do, and you're trying to stop it from achieving it. Or are you, or is its thing to kill you and you all need to die so it can go, I have completed my purpose, and then walk away again? Are there other ways of dealing with this? Monsters that have a very specific goal that you can interrupt is always a fun one-shot to plan around, because then you're thinking less about do I defeat this thing, and more about how do I complete this thing's goal without losing everything that I want. Mm -hmm. So it changes the dialectic again of just running in and punching heavily, so that also works really well for me. I think inevitable because I really like them, but it could be anything. It could be anything that has that kind of strict moral imperative, like a demon or a devil or even a celestial. Celestial gone wrong is also a really fun encounter because they're really powerful stat blocks and I'm very ready use them because why would you fight an angel? But they can get turned, get things wrong, get twisted as much as anyone else can, so I quite like those too. Mm -hmm. The third I had was thinking more in the sort of god direction. Mm -hmm. You don't have to necessarily have a god. That is quite a difficult thing to do anything with, because also as a DM, what can't you do is a line you have to decide on. Yeah but something that has a universe-altering imperative that it is trying to achieve, something that is beyond I must go and do X or go and complete Y, but something that is I have to destroy all of these things or I have to remove this city or I have to remove this whatever. It would need agents to do that. Again, we're talking celestials, fiends, undead, that sort of thing. In which case, it's less about one big fight and more about lots and lots of small fights that all hinder the machinations of a big enemy that will yep. always remain unassailable. You Is know? that a one-shottable idea, though? Because that feels like a campaign, a very interesting campaign with lots of machinations going My on. My problem with that being a campaign is down to um, players feeling like they can accomplish a goal. For me, that campaign is defeating the god. And mm-hmm. that's very difficult to DM unless, you have the, unless your god has a stat block, and then we get into very difficult conversations around how... like. Gods in D&D don't tend to have stat blocks in 5th edition. They did in 3rd, and I, I think that's a mistake. Because their ability to things like, you know everything. Like, what use is this character? Because I can't, 
yeah. I can't do anything against them unless I make them an idiot. And that doesn't work for me. It makes the players feel like they've done nothing against this. Like, yeah. at least things like archdevils and um, archdemons have the ability to be not necessarily stupid, but driven in a specific direction that means that their focus is all over the place. For me, that's a one-shot because you can make the encounters small. They're not all combat. Sometimes it's save all the villagers or whatever. And instead, what you're doing is proving to this god that this is actually going to be harder than they thought it was, and they've got to go and find another way to deal with it. That's um, the unstoppable force meeting the immovable object kind of mm -hmm. mission, where instead of trying to like subvert the goal of the powerful thing, you are literally going, no. All the little ways we can stop this from being a thing, we can stop being a thing now. And then it's about finding all the little moments that interact with each other to make that big thing whole. Mm -hmm. That's what I'd say for super high level, because super high level you are not... If it was a low level creature, like I've done one shots where it's like, oh, it's a vampire, or oh, it's a werewolf or whatever. That's about working out what it is and defeating it. Mm -hmm. That's the alien movie. Yeah. Like that there's loads of those and those are really fun to do but if you're going for like level 18 19 20 characters they can literally alter reality. Yeah. They can do incredible things. Fighting something humongous that can wipe them out by flattening them with its claw is fun but it's also as you said it's reductive. It's just mm -hmm. numbers and that's not that interesting. The ability to take that and go how can we expand on this idea? of what this is, how can we build out of it and construct it on a higher level and make it less about the fight and more about why the fight's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so... Which of those three I, appeals to you the most? I still think I would rather the god one be a slightly longer mm -hmm. thing than a one-shot. I think sure. this has got to be uh, a punchy and fun moment. Mm -hmm. So I think either the, the dragon or the inevitable. We had an inevitable recently on stream, and you yeah. had a big idea for the dragon with the elder brain dragon. I it's don't a know. It's a big stats. idea. I, I looked at it and <laughs> went, ugh. So. I don't know its stats <laughs> off the top of my head, so I'm going to go on DD Beyond now and look for its yes. stats. I'm yes, not sure what it's too. called, even. Is it an elder brain dragon? It's not called I that. Think, I think maybe. Okay. So, yeah, th th this is. It's called uh, an elder brain dragon. CR22. Brilliant. There you go. This is a good, good shout out for DD Beyond. We may be using it quite a lot during this uh, I mean, chat. it's an incredible resource, and hopefully through showing how to use it today we can talk about that resource because that's part of the part of the joy of the setup of DD beyond we'll get to it yeah. now i don't know a lot about these so let me read it one of the few mm -hmm. constellations available to those who must condemn their mind for their colony is the limit of its reach which spreads only to the far influence of the colony's elder brain yes this small solace withers away when a colony manages to capture a dragon. Teams of mind flayers bind the dragon, which is subject to a gruesome transformation as the elder brain latches onto the dragon's back and digs its tentacles into the dragon's brain. It's a general of illithid armies, free from confines of the brine pool. Uh, elder brains usually live in a pool and are therefore just <laughs> flaccid globs of brain. Floating brain. And it can spread very quickly with its breath weapon because its breath weapon can turn victims into mind flayers. That's very yeah. It cool. was it was the 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 detail of the breath weapon is essentially just it vomiting mind flayer tadpoles over yeah. everyone that made me go, oh god. That's amazing. I mean, that's oh god, and the DC is so high. Oh. <laughs> okay, well here we yep. go. So where would you start? If if the inspiration for you creating a one shot is this is the creature, mm. this is the fight. Mm -hmm. Where would you then start? Um I look at the stat block. Yeah. Stat blocks are really useful. Um stat blocks can be really heavy going because they're just a big lump of text and it's all got lots of like little numbers and squiggles and lines in it that make it look a bit like uh, what do I do with this but usually you can start piecing out from it how it works what if it, what its function is like start off legendary resistances it has four which is a lot legendary resistances means that you will probably have players saving their really high level spells or burning them out because the dragon can just go no yep. four times which is a lot um, so you want to make sure that the party aren't all casters. Easy first starting point. Casters and legendary resistances yeah. are a terrible combination. You need to make sure there's something there that monks are very good for stealing legendary resistances because of um, Stunning Strike, which is just mm -hmm. nightmarish for DMs. Um, it's immune to psychic damage. It's immune to the charm and frightened effect. It has blind sight for 120 feet and a passive perception of 28. No one's hiding from this thing. Mm -hmm. Its perception roll is a plus 18. <laughs> No one is hiding from this thing. It has an insight of plus 18. 
so no one is lying to this thing. It has redonkulous saving throws, which means it'll probably manage to avoid most stuff the party can throw at it. Its main lowest saving throw is dexterity, which means that it can... Dexterity saving throws tend to be um, spells that do damage. And normally it's a dex save for half, which means even ledge resistance will only take away half the damage. Which means that it's a thing that you really is designed to be like slowly whittled down in terms of hit points. It doesn't have a mythic form, which means it won't regain hit points or generate into a new into a new form and that sort of thing. So it is really just about finding ways to make it consistently do something. It's a siege monster. It does double damage to objects and structures, particularly bad against buildings. It doesn't require air or sleep. We'll come back to that. And this horrific tentacle breath, and also has a tadpole breath, and also has tentacles. It can grapple things. If it's huge or smaller, it can grapple it automatically when it hits huge it. Huge or smaller. Yeah, so this is, okay. This is a natural disaster. Mm-hmm. This is a monster that will annihilate a city. Yep. Because it is a siege monster, it can destroy things. Um, it can take people over really quickly. It can grapple and take away enemies that it doesn't want to have to deal with. And it can fly, so it can literally grapple you and fly away, which is a particularly grim ability. And it can get loads of allies with the brine breath, which looks complicated. Let's read this. Sure. 120 foot line, 15 foot wide. Recharge five and six. That means that you roll a d6 and it recharges on a five or a six. Um, yep. That means it will recharge on average one every, once every three rounds. So if we're making this a siege weapon that is making its way towards a town to destroy it, it will regain this a few times. Yeah. Which means that it will do this more often. It's a line, not a cone, which is a saving grace, I suppose, because a cone hits lots of things and a line tends to hit one big thing. So that means... Unless you're, if you're attacking a city that's built in handy blocks and people are all running away... It's true. Down one long block. Down one long block. You could also then create a second problem with the number of enemies you have to deal with. That's true. So DC 22 con save or 10 D10 psychic damage. So 55 is the average. Half as much on a success. So commoners would just fall to it instantly. On a success or failure. Wow. If the creature isn't a construct or an undead, it becomes infested with illithid tadpoles. So anything hit by it will. There is no question. While infested, it takes 16 3d10 psychic damage at the start of each of its turns. Repeats saving throw at the end of each of its turns, ending the effect of self success, blah, blah, blah. If the creature is targeted by magic that ends a curse or restores 40 hit points or more, which is a huge number, the Tadfall's infesting creature are killed instantly. If a human is reduced to zero hit points while infested, which is stable but remains unconscious for 60, 12 hours, when the period of unconsciousness ends, the creature transforms into a mind flare with all its hit points, casting a wish spell on the unconscious creature rids it the infestation, but that's the only thing you can do. That's all really bad, but it also means it can't just like fly over a village and tadpole it, and then instantly they all rise and fight with. Yeah. It's a war of attrition. Which means that one of these has attacked somewhere. Yep. People are starting to realize this is a humongous problem because pe- there are people turning into mind flayers, and it's coming back. Yeah, that's a and really you know awesome. Know that setup. maybe it's heading towards a mass population. Yeah, or maybe it's going somewhere else. Although that feels yeah. a bit drawn out for a one shot in your multiple locations. Yeah, if we set this in the one location, what springs to mind immediately from its abilities is it has attacked. Mm-hmm. Just by flying in and breathing on people. Yep. Um, people are unconscious. They're dead but not dead, which is already a lovely horror trope of the, I mean, mm-hmm. the alien around John Hurt's face is a classic image for oh, a yeah, reason. Yeah, yeah. yeah. People are turning into mind flayers in the in the in the hospitals, the, in the in the houses where they manage to run away to, coughing and sputtering. You are coming here because you've heard that they need help from a horrible dragon, and suddenly there's mind flayers. That's already yeah. a lovely twist on an existing like oh my god setup which is great yeah and also mind flayers are powerful but they're not crazy powerful and if the party are all super high level because they'll need to be still with a dc with a, with a cr22 creature um they might be able to 40 hit points is like a paladin doing a proper big old heal or it's one of the really big healing spells or it's up casting a cure wounds so you could potentially turn this around with a couple of really good healers in the party or they could kill the people and save them from their terrible plight. I would even take the horror element of a bit further 
and have them not have them turn into mind flayers per se, but humanoids with mind flare capabilities with this tadpole like leaning out of their mouth and like making it more horror zombie kind of setup because immediately nice. you're building into that sense of what this is. Yeah. Oh, that's gorgeous. And then it comes back and it's trying to infest more people and they have to defeat it. And it might fly off and fly towards somewhere else. It might do something else. But then you've got a big fight with it trying to stop it from doing more of this. Mm-hmm. And it's trying to get away from the party because they're hurting it and it just wants to find more things to oh, breathe. Oh no, someone's fighting back. Must flee. Exactly. Yeah. And also if a player character gets infected by this, which they will because on a success or failure, they're going to get infected by it. Um, they need to be healing each other really quickly to get rid of the condition, which is brilliant. It means that as a player, you are juggling the monsters getting away. My mm-hmm. buddy's not well. It's really fast because uh, it is really fast it flies 80 feet because dragons are fast yeah. so that becomes a really interesting how the hell do we deal with this combat and also means you were saying earlier about what if players railroad or, or do something break break the cycle that's a great use of players going I can do walls of force can we get yeah. it inside a building where it can't get out again and then you as GM go would it be dumb enough to go in there and unless there were hundreds of people in there it could infect oh god and suddenly the players having a really weird moral discussion about how to Te- yeah. coax it somewhere could they do a humongous illusion because they're really high level characters like you can play around it's got a perception of 18 but it's investigation which is the thing that breaks illusions is only a plus five so illusions might be a really good way to counter this thing for example mm-hmm. you as the dm have the beauty now of going i know all of this stuff and the players don't know any of this stuff yeah but i can hint and lead what yeah. if there's a wizard in this place who's already started thinking about this and gone, I don't think it's particularly, I mean, it's smart, but it's not that smart. Yeah. Example. And suddenly you're steering into ways of undermining the thing you've already placed there <laughs> and building that into how the players can interact with it. So what I've uh, what I've seen so far is you've looked at the stat. Sorry, block. I have just no. rambled. That's, this is this, this, this is how it tends to go for me. I'm sorry. It's this fine. Is... This, well, this is this is part of this this is part of what I wanted to do with this was looking at your specific process, mm. not as a um, you're speaking for all DMs. This is oh, how no, it no. should be done. No, no, not right? at all. No. Um, so so this is part of your process. So this is yeah. you know this is great, and I'm sure people are very interested. I am. Um, Thank you. So I've, what I've, I've seen so far, I've very much that, resisted. There's this trope online that a lot of DMs do videos about how to DM and stuff like that. And I've very much resisted being on other people's and doing our own. Because I do think so much of it is personal. Like, people will have different things they care about that are more exciting or more the thing they want to DM with and that sort of thing. My advice is always the same. It's it's anyone can do it. As long as you know what you want to do and how you want to do it, you'll be okay. Yeah. And that's the important thing. <laughs> Beyond yeah. that, as long as the player's having fun, if you have an audience, they're having fun. That's just it. That's what all people want. In my opinion. So what I want to do is yeah. break down what has just happened in that last ten minute Sure. My mind mind stream. Yes. Um and and break it down into little bullet points. So you've looked at the stat block yes. to see what the what just what the basic stats are, mm-hmm. what it's really good at mm-hmm. and what it's really bad at. Mm-hmm. And then you've applied that to what the players should be looking for in terms of okay, well, if it's not got a good investigation then illusions would be good to try and counter yes. it. Or there's no one sneaking up on it, for example. No. So you've already looked at things like if you end up with someone who's gone for a really sneaky rogue and their main thing is like, I'm just going to be sneaking, you know that you can probably, for the purpose of this one shot, say, save that character for another time. But this is the thing. Or, High level rogues. If we're talking, this is a CR, because it's a CR, let's talk about challenge ratings briefly. This yeah. creature's a CR 22. Challenge ratings in D&D are a really good guideline, but they're actually terrible at telling you the exact challenge rating of a monster, like how the party will deal with it. The, the idea of a challenge rating is that four um, characters of a level equal to the challenge rating should be able to defeat a monster. Mm-hmm. It's actually quite a poor method of dealing with it because some monster abilities at like CR 1 8th are absolute poison to characters that are below level one, that are at level one even. So it's it's useful, but it's a, it's a guideline. It's a good starting point. Like I would say that four to five, 18 to 20 level characters should be able to defeat this in three hours as part of a wider spread storyline 
mm-hmm. storytelling thing, which is what you're looking for. Yeah. So I think that's about right. I think there's a sort of right area. I, I tend to shy away from level 20 because the level 20 abilities that most characters get are, are ludicrous and make the game less about being inventive and more about, I want to trigger my nuke. Yeah. Which is a shame because it's not really, like at level 18, you've got Sion, you've got level nine spells. So a character could have Wish. And yeah. Wish is a great example of a spell that can change the entire game board. Like I wish yeah. this thing weren't here. Yeah. But then you as the DM have the freedom to go, you can't wish for that. <laughs> so. Yeah. I guess that that's the uh, the ultimate like yeah, issue that the player might throw at me that I cannot be prepared for. But mm. it does say in the rules, the DM can just yeah. say, no, you can't wish for that. You can wish for it to have half its hit points. Yeah. You can wish for it to not be able to fly anymore. You can wish for it to, um, for its... Uh, Brian, if it's tadpole Brian breath to um, not recharge for five rounds. Like, that's the kind of thing where I'd go, a wish is a nice, like, I can give you a benefit, but you can't nullify it. Yeah. Because it's too powerful for that. It's, it's too high a CR to be wiped out by your, <laughs> by your choices. So are there any, um, are there any character classes or subclasses that a player would pick that would make you go, mm, maybe not for this? Off the top of your head. I appreciate there's a whole bunch of them now. Yeah. Anything that relies on melee combat, I would be wary of unless you have a way of um, entering melee combat quite quickly because it can fly. Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have your barbarians and your fighters, but um, if they don't have a backup, um, for barbarians it's particularly tough not having a backup uh, ranged weapon because mm-hmm. barbarians are so designed for run into combat. Yeah. But give them boots of flying and suddenly it's not an issue anymore. And barbarians are also very fast and boots of flying are 60 feet of movement. So that means you're nearly as fast as it, which yeah. is really useful if it's not flying directly away from you so you can be slightly too close behind it. Like, I'd do something like that. That's what I would do. I would, give, I would make sure the characters that are focused on melee have the ability to enter it, which usually yeah. means the ability to fly in D&D terms because it adds that third movement. Um... I think that's the main one. I think I would be very careful around that sort of thing. I would also say that any creature, that any class that is specifically geared around psychic damage, maybe an aberrant mind sorcerer, I'd say this, or um, actually a lot of classes add psychic damage now. Fey, Wanderer, Rangers add psychic damage. Uh, Psyblades, all of their weapons damage is psychic damage. Something like that I might go... The, the the one thing you are fighting is immune to psychic damage. This might not be fun for you. Yeah. And that's how I would phrase it. This might not be fun for you. If the player goes, nah, then that's, they're cool. <laughs> yeah. they, can, they can do what they like. Um, it's not my place to tell them they can't do things most of them where I think they won't have fun. That's cool. Yeah. So if we're, if we're assuming, uh, what did you say, a level level 18, you'd say? Four, four to five level 18 players? Four to five level 18 players means they have a lot of stuff they can do. Mm-hmm. They can alter reality in ways that mean that this creature isn't unassailable. And it means that if there are mind flayers that get... If you have mind flayer um, enemies, which you should have, they should be mind flayers as people get turned into these horrible thing out the mouth, horrible things. That gives them something else to deal with, but they should be able to just one round, no. Yeah. Then what you're doing there in... <laughs> what you're doing there is you're killing resource. You're asking them to expend spell slots and things to... Um, stop that from being an issue which they then can't use later in the big fight although at yeah. level 18 they have so many spell slots and sorcery points and all the other like key points that in the end it won't matter <laughs> they, will, they will probably have plenty but it's nice to have that added in i'd say i'd say that around that sort of level yeah and in terms of um cause especially for one shots we tend to mm-hmm let people have a certain amount of magic items oh, what sure. would you say um letting people pick from for this i tend to go with the principle that um anything up to and not including legendary tends to be fine because you're capped by um you're capped by how many you can attune to mm-hmm. players can only attune to three items which is actually more limiting than people think because even if you have oh i've got boots of flying great they're attunable Anything that would require, yeah, anything that would be terrible for you to go and do something and then give to a party member to go and do it again. The design idea behind attunement is you can't do that because you have to attune to it. Um, that cuts back on a lot of things. I tend not to be that happy about can I have ten bajillion potions because no, 
where would you carry them? And also it's, un- yeah. unless you're playing an alchemist and that's the whole deal, then yeah, sure. But I tend not to bother with stuff like that. Same way if someone goes, can I have some magic arrows that do loads of damage? I'm not going to say, you've only got two. Like, sure, have ten. Yeah. I think at that level with this kind of thing that you're dealing with, I'd be very happy to be to discuss any item up to legendary, not including legendary, unless it was a character built around a legendary item. Which, would you let them have all three attunement slots or just one? I mean, probably, yeah. I mean, in the end, they're going to have fun, and that, that's the point. Yeah. Like, even if they cakewalk this entire thing, they've still had fun doing it. Yeah, and I guess that's that's kind of the point with these... Um, this is a big monster yeah. that you've probably not had a chance to play against. Yeah. It is more of a experimentation. Absolutely. But we're, we're going to dress it up and make it richer. Yeah. But this is a chance to play with the stuff that you've not had a chance to. How many campaigns get to that level? Very few. Yeah. And, I mean, people, people more often play characters at that level as part of one-shots. That's the more common way of getting to that point. And it's a great opportunity for a super awesome power build if you've got like four levels of this and ten levels of that and whatever. Mm -hmm. It's a great opportunity for a concept that you need like seven different classes to make. Like if you wanted to play Spawn, that's the one that often comes up because Spawn's very hard to make (laughs) as a single class. Right. (laughs) Or Ghost Rider, very hard to make as a single class. Yeah. If you wanted to play a character who is basically a sort of in-universe version of that, that's a great opportunity to go, what's this awesome power build that fits all these pieces together? Because no power build can deal with on a success or failure if the creature is in a construct or an undead, which no player character can be, even reborn or technically humanoid, um, you become infested with tadpoles. It doesn't matter how much cool power leveling stuff you've done, that is going to happen if the beam hits you. Yeah. So you've got to deal with it regardless. So there's yeah. a lot of question there about... Um, it's Actually, this monster is very nicely designed because it cuts away to a lot of the... Um, from a lot of the sort of big issue around high-level monsters, which is, oh, I've got an armor class of 24, so nothing can hit me. Yeah. Oh, I've got a, a saving throw of plus, well, this is a saving throw of plus 14 in places, nothing can stop me. Like, yeah, that's. The, I know that you can make characters like that, but having something that it doesn't matter is quite cool. Yeah. Remind me again, what is its AC? Oh, only 17. It's, it's yeah. quite easy to hit. Yeah. The thing is, it's fast, and it has 350 hit points. So, with the best will in the world, very few things do 350 hit points. Even power word killed means it has to have 250 hit points taken off it before it has any effect. Mm -hmm. So if you're saving that ninth level spell slot for it, I can get rid of it. If you whittle off 250 hit points, it's just a... I mean, even a... uh, Like, a paladin doing a full smite on a heavy thing can do like a hundred. If they're lucky and they burn every like resource they have to get to that point, but very few things can burst damage more than like a hundred. So here's the cheeky question, yeah. is that would you want Em and Rebecca to play yeah. this or not? They'd have a lot of fun. They'd have a huge <laughs> amount of fun, are you kidding me? Of course I'd love to. I love... <laughs> As in, like, do, do you want people who can make characters that do this stupid yeah. amount of damage? I think to it'd be, be yeah. fun, because then what you're trying to do is get to the point where they can get that one hit in. And then it's yeah. your job as a DM to go, it's fast, it can fly. You need to set up the opportunity for you to get this one hit in, and then it has to hit. And you can build all around this big hit, or if you had an archer character which you'd statted to high craziness with fighter and rogue levels, and there's a really cool way to make an archer, which is really cool, which I've given to friends before us to play, and you can build up to, like, this arrow will do 40-odd points of damage, and I can shoot five of them and whatever. Like, I can see the build-up to all of that, and if anything, it gives the players a chance to show off. And Mm -hmm. I like giving players a chance to show off. I want them to go, I've done the super cool thing. And for me as DM to go, you have done the super cool thing and here's what it looks like when it happens and I hope this makes you feel as proud and excited as I am that you've done it because that's yeah. why I DM. <laughs> like that's, I want my friends to do cool stuff. Mm-hmm. To feel like heroes for a second. Like that's, that's the point. And cool. I think this creature has the opportunity to do that and also to give healers an opportunity to feel like they're making a big difference because that mm. you're infested regardless thing. It's a remove curse as an action. That's a big ask in the middle of combat. Healing 40 hit points or more. If you've got a heal prepared, like, again, this is sort of having played quite a lot and knowing this stuff, the spell slots above level five don't stack up very quickly. Mm-hmm. So even as 18th, 17th, 18th level character only has two six level spell slots, maybe three by this point. No, I think only, I think it goes beyond two. That means that the heal spell, which is the best one in the game, heals 70 hit points like that. That would get rid of these. But yep. that's a humongous resource boost. That's all gone. 
That's a lot yeah. to ask. And even if you were a sorcerer twinning it on two people who needed it, that's burning seven sorcery points, which is seven out of your total of 17, 18, which suddenly yeah. you go, ooh, this is that's a resource funky. fight. I didn't think this was a resource fight, but it could be. Yeah. yeah. Like, I think this has all of the elements there of a really nasty encounter that the players can find very cool ways to fight against and deal with. I think that's very, yeah. very cool. Cool. Yeah. Okay, so we've looked at the, the actual monster stat block. Yes. And we know that it's going to have, we, we know the, the loose story and the build up to it and the mm -hmm. fact that there are going to potentially be um, other mind flayers as well or some kind of homebrew yeah. uh, humanoid zombie oh, nearly wow. mind flayer. If you want to get into that, like, even without homebrew, mind flayers have an army of existing like monsters they associate with, mm. like intellect devourers, which just brains with legs. They're like brain <laughs> dogs. <laughs> and they've got all sorts of stuff like that that you could just dig through the monster manual or yeah. search them on DD Beyond. There's, there's really nice tagging systems on there to find loads of things that are close to that. Or you just take a mind yeah. flayer stat block and just reflavor it, but just use the stat block. Yeah. I tend to do a lot of that, honestly, if I'm home brewing i just use another yeah. stat block and make it sound different and look change different. the label change the description exactly yeah that's good to know so we've got uh we've got some critters and, and minions building up to the big bad mm -hmm. we know um in terms of the players what we're going to give them the freedom to do what we're gonna um tweak and suggest if they don't if if they go a certain path sure. um so let's let's look at the actual um the practicalities of it so where sure. would you start in terms of would you write a little um would you would you write that down would you write an opening paragraph would you come up with that on the fly what i tend to do is we've got a sense of what we're doing and it's yep. also built into it a sense of tone yeah this is horrible it is horror. Mm -hmm. What can we do to heighten the effect of the horror without breaking the structure of the game? Mm -hmm. The obvious one for me is it's raining. Because yep. instantly that's just creepier. If it's storming, it's raining, it's dark, it's very hard to see, and something horrible flies overhead and it's wash of tadpoles, the briny water with weird things in it flops down all over the streets. Like that's the visual and the, the um, you could describe the smell of that, the texture of that, the feel of that. I find all of that much more important than scripting because people don't, people tend to think visually or orally or whatever, but if you start giving them smells and tastes and um, you can describe things as looking slimy, even if they're not, and you can get a visual of that, but your brain also kicks into like what it would yeah. feel like and yeah. suddenly players are more invested and are more in the moment and are more grounded. I tend to think more in terms of tone, in terms of um, aesthetic, in terms of style, and in terms of how I want to feel describing it, and then how I want the players to feel hearing it. Yeah. Because at that point, once I've got all those pieces, I feel fairly confident, and this is also experience, and I appreciate this is experience over a first time, that I can describe it with that mindset, with that heart set, maybe, in mind, and allow people to work their way into it and find the monologuing points that aren't me just monologuing because I want to monologue. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, there are times when I want to monologue. I'm not going to kid myself, of course there are. But they tend to be when I want to describe something I've thought of in terms of style, flavour, mm -hmm. tone. Like the maze in Warriors, yeah. I had a very specific idea there of this is something that is unnaturally like blasted into stone. And I wanted to get that sense of the rigidity of it and the the unnaturalness of, oh, normal cat, what? Why is this a straight line? This feels wrong. And I wanted that more than I wanted anything else. So when we did get to that point, I, I don't think I'm on log for that long, but it was very much a, you feel the sense that this is eerily right angled and structured yeah. in a place where you wouldn't expect it. And I think that's more evocative, and I think it's better for players to imagine than giving this sort of very specific paragraph about here's what is happening and here's where it is and here's all the yeah. pieces. Yeah. But for a first time, yeah, script it. If, if it's where you want to be, script it. Or write down bullet points of what you want to say. You don't have to. Do, that's. I think that's personal more than anything else I'd say. I think yeah. trying, to, trying to say this is what you should do feels very difficult because I think every DM would approach that differently. Yeah. 
Um, and it, let, let's stick with the practical um, mm-hmm. elements of it as well. So I I know that you happen to record with a dual screen setup, I do, right? Yes. You, yeah. So you have uh, your Zoom window on one mm-hmm. and then all of your notes on the other. Is it all digital <laughs> notes? I will be completely frank and say that I very rarely have written notes these days. I sure. used to. I used to write a lot more notes. Um, I use services like Trello and mm-hmm. other um, note-taking apps, often for NPC names. Yeah. I mean, you forget them. If, if you have a campaign with four million NPCs, you're going to forget them. And yeah. having like a note about what accent they have, a bit of their backstory, stuff like that is incredibly useful because they will come up like that. But otherwise, I tend to do quite a lot of it based on story notes and thoughts that I have had about tone and style and feel. And then occasionally writing down a name if I need an NPC and I haven't got one. Yeah. That, but that's me. Like, I, I know that when I was younger, when I was first starting doing this in a big way, I had much more comprehensive Trello boards with um, full detailed notes on individual bits and things that might come up later. And a service where you can like categorize and collate notes in different formats and where you can put, I need these ones over here and these ones over here, depending on how your brain works. Like mine is very, when it was structured, it was very much structured around, um, yeah, I want the NPCs I feel are probably evil, but not necessarily bad. Just, I want to give them that sense of, you don't know if you can trust them or not. They're all over there. And this list is all the NPCs who are friends, but they don't need to be nice. They just need to be, like, I have a tendency, as you probably noticed, to play NPCs who are not necessarily the worst as forgiving, understanding, um, trying to make them seem like, yeah, they're they're, they're on the other side of this conflict from you, but they're not an arsehole. Mm Mm-hmm. I, do, I think there's a list of assholes and not assholes because I try to make villains assholes so you don't feel bad about killing them. <laughs> I try to yeah. make non, I try to make everyone else not an asshole so that there's the possibility for negotiation, discussion. Maybe morally, it's not all that bad. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know that's. Sort of and then there's Laryl, who is technically not an asshole, but is an asshole. Yeah, I mean, Laryl. We don't want to get into this specifically no, again. But, we've um, chatted about Laurel before on the on the. I would say with any of them, part of the joy then is about finding the ones that sit right on that border. Yeah. Wait, because that way the players are unsure if I'm setting them yeah. up to be a villain or not. Yeah. So with a campaign like this, where mm. um, where really the N- NPCs are going to be providing um, context clues, maybe yeah. helping, maybe victims, but they're yeah. not they're not the primary reason that the the players are there like interacting with them is not the main feature of this one shot no no i'd say not apart from the one obvious one which is a dragon itself yes sure I, i'm looking at like villager npcs oh i see yeah i right. wouldn't do too much sketching you've got some yeah. victims who are going to be the ones they probably have to fight later um i'd have some kind of authority figure um yeah. i would cheat um, instead of having, there's a king and also a so-and-so, I would have one authority figure that is, I hired you or I asked you to come because this is bad. Um, you have a choice in this one, which is fun, but whether it's a wizard or a cleric. Now, these are very broad, branching, like, stereotypes, but frankly, start there. Like, if you want to create more complex NPCs for longer-winded, these are things, feel free to build them out, but when you're doing quick ones like this, just have a stereotype. They work. Um... If it's a cleric, they know about the fact that healing people works, but they can't heal that many people and they're running out of time, which gives you that plot strand immediately. Mm -hmm. But I think we're already going to have that plot strand because people are going to walk into town, the characters are walking into town and suddenly they're being attacked by horrible mind flayer humanoids. So that's already covered, kind of. Whereas the whole, this dragon's actually susceptible to illusions and we're leading them in that direction could be more of a wizardy character because illusions aren't really cleric forte. If anything, you've got the opportunity for some kind of wizard cleric-y combo maybe so a, a cleric... multi-class potentially a multi-class very hard to very hard to um npc a multi-class because you feel like you're drawing it in two directions mm-hmm. you do have clerics of gods of magic so clerics of mistra or of i was going to say azuth that's old edition um what's he called um savras is a divination which is quite a fun interesting cleric because it's it's a cleric of wizardy stuff so mm-hmm. you can play with that too in terms of stuff like that, um, in terms of like in-universe stuff, that's actually quite a pretty yeah. conversation to have. I know some of the universes, Faerun being a good example, quite well because I've played in it for years, but that doesn't mean that everyone else does. So whatever you decide to put in, players will probably just go with. 
Yeah. Um, there are Forgotten Realms wikis, and I think Forgotten Realms is a great place to play because most players know it, sort of, and that kind mm -hmm. of ticks that box. It means no one's going, hang on, in this world are there guns? You can go, it's Forgotten Realms. The answer is, mm, sort of. So <laughs> that's, that's, that sort of covers that ground. Yeah. So, um, and then you can just Google it, and their wiki's really good. And you can then go, hang on, if I want to use a real place in Forgotten Realms, real. If I want to use a canon place in Forgotten Realms, which of these would be good places to do? What kind of vibe do, do I want gothic city streets like with thatched roofs and people running around screaming? Or do I want like this sort of dwarven built into a mountain complex which makes getting around more complicated and means the verticality of the dragon is more interesting? It's up to you really. I mean, if the party can fly, it makes zero difference. It's just window dressing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So let, let's go back to our, our summoner NPC, mm -hmm. our, our plot hook NPC. Yeah. Um, would you, on the off chance that they are, um, it's made available to them that they could help the party, mm -hmm. would you give them a stat block? I would give them a stat block for safety because you never know. I would yeah. use an existing one. I would um, yeah. use an existing stat block that's already out there and um, just put another name on the top yeah. of it, I wouldn't make my own because making your own stat block for, they're not the same as a player character at that level. Yeah. They're different and they have different builds and sets. Um, the new monster- Is, Are there any particular ones that you kind of have a standard like, oh, there's a, there's a cleric -y NPC of this kind of higher level. Are there any that you know of that you would- Off the top to? of my head, no, but I would just go on beyond tag humanoids and scale by level. <laughs> Sure. Like, hang on, I'll do it now. Just to prove how easy it is, yeah. I'll do it now because I'm on Beyond. Sure. In, if you look at me looking at my screen here when I'm DMing, it's often on Beyond because yeah. it's so easy to do this stuff. So if I tag humanoids, there we go. And then I search by CR and put the highest CR at the top. There we go. Uh, Quenthal Bainra is a drow priest slash wizard. It's all very disintegrating and negative and... I don't think that would work very well. Lairil is uh, CR 17. There's some specific abilities around using her hair to hit people and the <laughs> spell fire, but otherwise she's a very powerful wizard. Mm -hmm. That strikes me as an easy starting point. Potentially that person's too high level, they might be able to deal with this on their own. I'd go a bit lower CR maybe. No, that's, that's too much. <laughs> I would just look through them. I'm currently just looking through them yeah. right now and find something that seems sort of almost fitting or not and then use it yeah. if you have time and you really want to making your own stat blocks is fun but if you're a beginner then my god it's complicated and yeah. just use an existing one and reskin it there's there's no need to go over the board on that frankly the internet is also full of stat blocks other people have made if you google wizard cleric level so and so npc you'll probably find something cool and then you can do a shout out if you want to or you can just reskin it and never tell anybody no one will yeah. ever know <laughs> okay so we have our big bad, we have the minions, we have potential NPCs yes. and a like a rough, we have a vibe for the town. I'm not going to go into like, do you draw out a map or do you dis like decide exactly where everything is? Because it's a one shot, right? It also, I don't, I, I never do. Yeah. I, I, Fair enough. By creating a locked physicality to a space, you are locking yourself in, which you're locking the players in by description. Of course you yeah. are. Whenever you describe something, it is real. Ergo, when well, it's, it's real in their minds, you know what I mean? Um, the moment you say it's a 20 foot tall wall, it is now a 20 foot tall wall because you said that it is and the players will try and work around the 20 foot tall wall because that's what you've said it is. If a player then says, oh, are there any cracks or holes in the wall? You can go, yeah, there's one over there if you want them to get through it. Or you can go, Nope, solid, if you want them to have a bit of a harder time going around it. If you preset all of that, you have no idea what they're going to do. Yeah. <laughs> We're not writing this for publication. We're not writing yeah. a one-shot so that someone over there can run it and they need all the information so they can run it however they see fit. We are writing something for us to run on a stream. So it doesn't matter. Potentially. Oh, are you? No, no, <laughs> I see the look. This is, you're oh, excited. Scary. <laughs> scary. <laughs> okay, then okay. let's get to this side of it. No, 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 now it's my turn. Well, I, what, I have what feels to... scary? Where's the where's the fear coming from at this point? Because you've got a style, you've got a monster. Yes. What um, else I... would you need to feel comfortable? Okay, I guess the the difference being for doing it on stream compared to off. Ah. Doing it off stream, I I think I would be absolutely fine because I could spend 
10 minutes going, wait, I did, let me reread that again. Because there's a lot going on at this high level. Absolutely, yeah. That, that I think, would be the main thing I would be concerned about. I mean, um, not to whereas, break the fourth wall too much. I know we, we use pause. I know we pre-record, and I know we use pause cards and that kind of thing. But yeah. I feel it's the kind of thing that you don't want to play it. Like out of it. ripping, ripping the plaster off and diving in at that level, when stuff doesn't necessarily come to me as innately as it would do, hopefully in in time. Um, I think would yeah would would make things a bit start stoppy. And we'll probably make what is usually a three to four hour recording session into like an eight hour one. It wouldn't take that long. There's never going to be any level of complexity where you go, hang on, I want to check a rule that lasts longer than five minutes. Because even if the answer is, I don't know, it's then your job to go, I'm going to rule that this. Mm -hmm. And whatever you rule, the players need to go with even if they don't like it, and if they don't like it that much, they'll let you know and you can go, maybe I should rule the other way so everyone's happy. Which I, I, you've seen me do before, I've no problem going, I think I'm going to rule this, oh, but now we're all unhappy. Fine, I'll rule that, whatever. Like, it, it's about moving it on, not about being yeah. right. So, I think you'd be fine with that. Also, knowing you personality-wise, you'd be fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make a decision, that's final. Um, <laughs> the other thing with running at higher level, if anything, most of the players will be in the same boat as you. Very few people have played characters level 18. So you will all be in a position of, I'm not 100% sure of what I'm doing, which means that all of you together are giving each other the confidence to move it forward at that point. Mm -hmm. Also, designing a level one one-shot is extremely difficult mm -hmm. because players have four hit points yeah, and probably not enough healing to revive them if they go down. So suddenly you're looking for monsters that are low enough CR, but still fun, that yeah. tell a story that isn't you're all dead now. <laughs> yeah. I would say DMing up to level five is harder than DMing at super high level. Yeah, I, I would say that's interesting. So I have, um, <laughs> spoilers, I have been working on a homebrew one shot that I've Ooh. I've kind of just finished, um, but I was trying to aim it at a level five-ish level. Five's grand, um, five's really and good. Now, Three I, to five onwards, yeah. you're, you're singing, you're dancing. They've got all their special abilities, nothing can hurt them anymore. I mean, yeah. as a DM, nothing can hurt the players. It doesn't matter what you do, nothing can hurt them. They are designed <laughs> to not die and you don't want them to, so this is good for everybody. Like, well, my my issue that I um, I had actually was finding um, the monster that I the, the the something that fit with what I was going for in terms of the story, mm -hmm. um, and actually I ended up with the only options that I was left with were all hags, and I was like I don't actually want it to be a hag, so I ended up kind okay. of. I, so I know you can like reskin it and make it a different person, but it was the the fact that it was like. I am a human esque person who is talking to you was not what I was after. What were you so after? So I ended up. Well, I don't want to say because. Oh, I, I see. Want okay. To keep that secret. From a from a context perspective, reskinning often gets to reskin something and say this person is now a Goliath and not a dwarf, for example. Classic mm -hmm. reskinning. Um, you can swap around a couple of racial features and it's all fine. Um, yeah. When it comes to higher level creatures. I'm going to give you an example. I'm currently on really high-level humanoids, and for some reason or other, I have uh, the Black Staff, I just a fire right now. I absolutely love the Black Staff. They are great. She is great. Sorry. <laughs> She's a they in one of my home home games, and that gets confusing, but she is great. Um, she is a high-level caster, has ninth-level spells. She has the Black Staff, special equipment. However... If we just assume the Black Staff doesn't do the whole animating the walking statues, dispel magic on touch, that sort of thing, all it is is a staff that does slightly more force damage on a hit. Mm -hmm. Up to ninth level spell slots and magic resistance. That's basically all she wrote. That's all the stat block is. That could easily be a spider that lives on a ceiling and casts mm -hmm. spells instead of hitting people with webs and that sort of thing. Because all, everything that's there is exactly the same. Yeah. Just you've flavoured it differently. Like, if you don't like the look and sound and smell of a hag, you can use another creature with the same CR if that's what you want to balance it around, and just go, I'll use that creature and give it a completely different look and style. Exactly, yeah. because all you need to do then is add a, like a couple other details, and you've already got the same 
creature the same sort of abilities. You're just tweaking the variations on why it works the way it does. Hmm. The, because D&D stat blocks are by nature immensely reductive, because <laughs> they have to be to simplify any kind of this is how a character works process, you can take any stat block from any creature anywhere and go, I want to make it more of this sort of thing. Look at similar creatures at higher and lower levels and go, hang on, they're all resistant to that or they're all immune to that. Okay, that's easily transferable. And that's how most new monster stat blocks are made. <laughs> that's all it is. So homebrewing that sort of thing and reskinning and that sort of thing, they are really useful tools for making the tone of the adventure the way you want it to be. And going, I've, yeah. I've got this stat block, but it's wrong. Okay, let me use that and munge that on top. Of that. I'm sure it's fine. And it normally is. Unless it really, really isn't, and then you go, oh, well, it didn't work, <laughs> which happens, <laughs> and it's okay that it does. I consistently make things that don't work, and it's fine. But again, one shot, chance to experiment. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. One shots are great for experimentation, especially with characters and stories and everything else. Well, we've already run over, but I did <laughs> want to. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, but I wanted to make sure that we were we were looking at things thoroughly, and I imagine we could keep going for hours and hours and hours. But mm -hmm. what I wanted to um, check was so running through our list, we have our monster, we have potential um, minions, we have NPCs, we've covered players, we've covered the location and the description of the setting. What else would you want? To, what other boxes would you want to tick before you would? And we've also talked about like note structuring if you were doing sure. them. Sure. Um, what other boxes would you want to take for you to feel ready to dive in and play this? I, okay. The one big thing I still want to add in is the performance of it. Yeah. Is there a potential? We'll come back to that in a second. Sorry, it's a bigger one. The performance of it for me is then, how do I want to narrate it? We talked about notes on um, feel, style, tone, aesthetics, but then how do I want to do it? What's the bit where I go, this is something I'm going to really enjoy putting my players on? I'm going to use Ed as an example. I will always use Ed as an example. Ed is my favourite human. After Emma, of course. And Ivo and sure, other sure. people I shouldn't yeah, care yeah, about. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> I love DMing for Ed because Ed has a very specific I don't like tentacles thing. But it's not I don't want it on stream, don't do it. It's a mm, and that's beautiful because it means all I have to do then is go um, a tentacle snakes out of its mouth and another mouth goes <laughs> and suddenly and then I'm thinking about how that's going to affect the player. And I'm thinking about how can I most horribly yet not in an overly triggering over the top way describe this horrible monster in a way it's going to be super fun and then i get excited by the fun of it and that that will drive me on for some points there because in the end you're not dming this one shot because you have to you're not dming it because you feel like you should if you if you didn't enjoy it or love it why would you do it mm -hmm. so what i now want to find is all the bits that i absolutely love and adore and how i'm going to present them like, how do I want to present this horrible breath weapon? It's awful. Is yeah. it like, does it stick to walls? Does it like mm -hmm. splatter over and then these things just, or are they yeah. tiny and they're really small and you can't see them until it's like on you and there's just, they're all like, oh, yeah, I'd want to spend a bit of time. Like, I do quite a lot of bath thinking, just sat in a bath going, that would be a lovely, awful description. Or that would be a lovely, yeah. powerful description. Like thinking about like the, um, it's often to do with, um, what's that Ruskin thing? The unknowable, the un indescribable thing. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what it's called. I cannot help you, I'm um, It's not ringing any bells for me. Um, there was a lovely, um, about describing the indescribable, describing mm -hmm. the unknowable. Finding ways to get players to visualise and corporealize something like that is one of my favourite things about DMing. Mm -hmm. So finding the, verbi finding the verbiage, finding the language, finding the... Um, the way to explain it to get them in. That would be my next big thing. Because I've got the concept now. That's great. Yeah. Love it. It's all grand. Now I want to go, how do I make it amazing? Mm -hmm. And that for me is about the performance of it. Um, the other thing we haven't talked about yet is the dragon itself. If I remember correctly, and I'm off the stat book now, but if I remember correctly, it is a dragon that has been absorbed into a mind flare colony. Dragons are yeah. super intelligent and smart creatures. Mm. How does it feel? How did that happen? How did that happen? Does it want this to end? Is it desperate for the players to kill it so that it doesn't have to deal with this anymore? Can it be saved? I don't know. Do I want the players to feel empathy? Do I want them to feel for this creature and want to save it? Or do I want them to just destroy the horrible monster? 
I tend to fall on the side of it of everything should be empathizable with, but it's a three hour one shot and there may not be enough time, so I might this time just go, just make it nasty. In which case, <laughs> make it an asshole. Perfect. I wanted this. Mm, I'm more powerful than I ever could have been. What use yeah. is a horde of things when I now have a horde of people? Oh, mm -hmm. oh, it's horrible. A horde of people. Why would a dragon want a horde of people? And then you start creating the character of this nefarious fucking nightmare where the Elder Brain took it over and went, now I control you. And the dragon said, no, no, now I control <laughs> no, no. you. <laughs> yeah. That's maybe the Elder Brain wants to be cut off from it. Like, please make this end. I was happier in a cave. Like, maybe yeah. that's something you could throw in as a weird little, like, maybe you mm -hmm. feel some sympathy for them. I don't know. There's all of those elements now start to float around for me, and maybe those become elements of the wider plot. Although I am very wary of adding too much material because it's yeah. a three hour one shot and it has to have a good finite closing. So, yeah. Tricky. Very tricky, but achievable. Finding yeah. that balance between all the things I get excited by and then the things I actually want the players to deal with. That's, yeah. Those are the two big things we haven't covered yet that, that are at the heart of what I like about DMing, frankly. But yeah. And how long do you reckon, obviously, like, we've we've jimmied this together in yeah. just over an hour, um, but how long would you want, like, would you feel comfortable, for example, like, doing that, hopping in that right now, or would you want to ruminate and let it stew for maybe a couple of days to just The let... way I contextualise it is, could I run it now? Yeah. Do I want to run it now? Yeah, it'd be great fun. Would it be so much better in two days' time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would it be so much better in a week's time? Maybe not. Like, I've got to find a, a happy place where it fits all of those things. And often what happens is I'll go, I found its happy place, now it is on ice. Now it's mm -hmm. ready. And now, also, we haven't talked about this that much, but the players will change it. Mm -hmm. Like, yes. if four players turn up and they all want to play warlocks, one of them's got to be connected to this elder brain somehow. Maybe that's like an aberrant mind is a particularly weird thing to play in a thing that is immune to psychic damage, but maybe your master told you to help its elder brain get off the back of this awful dragon that wants to destroy everything. Maybe. Yeah. Um, maybe a player wants to create the world's best dragon hunter, and there are classes that work really well for that, like Monster Hunter Rangers do that really well, there's all sorts of things. And maybe you're then going, okay, maybe your drivenness is part of the issue here. Maybe this dragon is really empathetic and relatable and you're, you're the problem. Like there's there's ways of playing around with that, depending on the player. Like some players would go, no, I just want to be kill stuff. And then you go, cool, yeah. make a character that kills stuff. That's totally fine. But you want them to be part of it and yeah. their choices will affect what you want to do. I mean, all cards on the table. If I was told to run a one shot in a week's time, I would barely even do this work until the players had told me something about their characters because if it didn't fit, it would be a shame to go, here's this cool adventure and these five yahoos. <laughs> <'Cause> yeah. <laughs> yeah. My least favorite D&D game stream book anything is, oh my God, this super cool adventure and here are some randos because it doesn't really feel like they're involved. Like I love how the new D&D books, especially the official ones, work really hard to give you backgrounds that suit the adventure and make a new character for this story. Don't just bring in random Yahoo A from over there. Make a new character who does this. Yeah. Because chances are, if you're running this as a home game, it'll develop out of that into something long-winded and running forever anyway. Or it won't. You'll all have a great time and then you can go and do something else now, again later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Well... <laughs> Do you have anything else that you wanted to add? Not when oh, you're running I'm gonna let that. <laughs> uh, I and know. can I play in it? Because I love high level TNT and I never <laughs> get to play it. <laughs> now you'll know the secrets. Okay, you and I have talked about this before. <laughs> I love playing, I, I, li I like playing smart characters, but also in something where I have pre existing knowledge. Like Em and I talk about Em's campaigns, or we talk about my campaigns. Um, we tend to go towards characters who are a bit dumber. Because then, sure, we know, but what does it matter? Because our character doesn't, and we've made someone who is wholly unsuited for this task, and won't it be fun? <laughs> because that's that's more it's more fun to play someone wholly unsuited than someone completely suited for a task. Well, or someone who has the, the kryptonite. Like the yeah. kryptonite to the encounter, that's a fun thing to play. Knowing going in saying I made a healer, because I know a healer's gonna be important in this campaign, is great, but then also it is gonna be important, it's a good thing to have in the party, and no one ever wants yeah. to, apart from me, apparently. So I like playing the healer. I do. I've done it a few times and it is it is great fun because you get to bolster everyone else. Yeah. Which is really lovely. 
I do keep meaning, like, at, at some point, at some point, I am going to play a, a spellcaster on stream. <laughs> It's gonna have. I've, I've been playing them all in like one shots and mm. other off air games, but on stream I tend to have just we've, been playing Marshall so far. We've talked about this before, but um, I do think there are spell casting classes that work a lot better for my first caster than others. Mm -hmm. I think there are certainly subclasses that work way better for my first caster than others, and especially on stream, you want to be something you're comfortable with. So, Warlocks, it's a great starting point. You've got so few spell slots anyway, you're probably Eldritch Blasting every 30 seconds. You've got a very basic starting point there and going, oh, I've got this one clever thing I can do. Great. And then as a wizard, I've got these 10 clever things I can do. Great. As a sorcerer, I've got these 14 clever things I can do. Also, I can swap out spell slots and um, sorcery points and, oh, God, the juggling. Oh, God. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I think sorcerer is the worst for that. Sorcerer is the class where you go, okay, your list of spells is more limited, but your flexibility is so much higher. Do all of That's things. complicated. Yeah. 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 We've though. gone very off topic. Now. Yes, we have. Sorry. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start running the outro stuff. Um, usually I'd ask if there's anything else that you would like to plug, but it's it's probably this. It's, it's um, all together. This is your baby. I'm, I'm gonna plug one specific thing, and that's Twitch chat. You all need to tell Nat that you want <laughs> Nat to run this so we can run it. If you push hard enough, Nat will do it. You need to all say now. I do bow under pressure. No, I, I don't bow under pressure. I will not visit. Oh, but I do kind of want to do it. Oh, but no. Nat, they want you to do it because they like you. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> we don't know that. We're recording this in advance. They, they might be saying, this sounds like a terrible idea. No Who one knows? is saying that. Anyway, thank you for joining us uh, for Talk Together. Uh, this was Talk Together. Uh, it, it, it runs on Fridays from 6 p.m. till 7 p.m. Currently BST. Uh, yeah. Sometimes GMT, but no, ignore that. Not now. <laughs> uh, if you want to watch the D and D games that we we play, uh, they're, they're on Mondays and Tuesdays yes, from 6 p.m. till 9 p.m. Yes, BST. Yes. Um, and at the moment, we've got um, we've got in Niles' campaign on Mondays, Into the Wastelands, the Eternal Army, oh, yeah. and 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 on Tuesdays. And I think we, we've just we've just had uh, we've just had a little little sneaky link to to, to one of my characters appear in that one. <laughs> um, keep keep an eye out for that. Um, <laughs> People, people talk behind the scenes. Oh, oh no! <laughs> um, and on, and on Tuesdays, uh, we're, we're we're doing horror in Neverwinter again with uh, with Sean and uh, Viscous Cycle, and mm -hmm. it's it's bees and eyes. <laughs> it's <laughs> just the nice bees thing, and it's, eyes. It's not, it's not just bees and eyes anymore. It's also like weird animal splicing, and it's it's got all the horror. I love it. It's gorgeous. It's I love so it. off the wall. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> and owlin owlin dentists. That's a new addition, an owl. And <laughs> oh, sorry, Dentomancer. That might Dentomancer. be my favourite thing we've ever done. Yeah. I, love it. I love it. I want. I want all of the the home homebrew different spell types. Yep. More more of that. More Some of that, teeth. please. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all of our shows stream here, which is twitch.tv slash RollTogetherRPG, or if you're not watching here, you might be watching on YouTube. Uh, hello, you can find us here as well. You might be listening on a podcast. Hello, podcast listeners. Hello. Hello, podcast listeners. <laughs> the, the, I, the, the, the. Listen, no, no, no. <laughs> Listen, no, no, no. I speak for a living. Um, the, the VODs, if you are watching on Twitch, VODs are available immediately after the stream to catch up um, as well. And, and a huge thank you to all of our sponsors and supporters and our D20 club because you're all amazing and fantastical. Um, unless you're bullying me to DM right now because. That's, they won't that's, bully that's, you. They will tell you how honestly they love you <laughs> and want to see you DM. That's what's happening uh -huh. right now. Uh -huh. Sure. I bet. I trust. Our, I trust. Our, I trust all of the people okay. who watch our shows. Well, with that in mind, I beg you all, please stay classy at the table. Indeed. Mm -hmm.